planning on getting a uh, some sort of uh, sit stand desk and uh, treadmill or something like what you and Toffee have. Because <laughs> uh, I need to move more than I am. So, yeah. Welcome back, everybody. Uh, what a week last week. Glad we're all here and I uh, uh, hope you made pro progress on your projects. And we'll, uh, we'll be asking you, uh, you know, over the next few weeks about how, you know, how we can help and if, if another check-in is useful. Like a few people mentioned that already. So um, we're gonna be trying to figure out how to connect to you as much as possible during the next weeks while you're working on those. Um, <clears throat> okay. so. Everybody's excited about reinforcement learning. Uh, here we go, we're gonna talk about it today. So uh, why is everybody excited about reinforcement learning? Um, there's a couple results that have come out, I think recently that just look awesome and are really capturing people's imagination, right? So the open AI learning dexterity where they first were just manipulating blocks and then doing a Rubik's cube, um, super impressive, uh, good, good results uh, <clears throat> with a seemingly very simple recipe, right? Uh, just come up with a simulator. We have some good simulators now, write a pretty simple cost function. And, and, on, and to their credit, I think the cost function was actually very simple in this task and then apply relatively vanilla, deep policy gradient, the same things that worked for Dota, the, the same algorithm they're gonna apply to the, to the hand. And that's amazing. And, you know, if we, you know, if, if Go is hard and DeepRL solves AlphaGo and Dota is hard and, and reinforcement learning serves, you know, can solve Dota, then manipulation is hard, maybe it can solve manipulation too. And I think there's some something to that actually. <clears throat> so there's a couple other like really good examples, even before, um, this is, uh, I put in the iframe, that was the easiest way for me to give you all the little gifts that they have on this page. but. This is um, you know, some of the earlier work showing that DeepRL could work on real robots and actually be trained um, in a reasonable amount of time on real robots, especially if primed with, um, with an initial demonstration or policy. So they were doing what we would consider to be pretty dexterous manipulation with contact that is um, non-trivial, complicated. Um, you know, we haven't given you planning algorithms that would be good enough to do that task yet. We're going to talk more about what we can do next week and for the same sort of algorithm to work on a variety of different tasks um, you know from flipping a, a block and like i said they accelerated with human demonstrations but um, it's also a very impressive suite of results in simulation of a fully dexterous hand doing you know really complicated tasks and actually i'll tell you the thing i like the most about this is um I mean, it looks a little weird, right? It doesn't look like a human manipulation, but it actually doesn't look like the robotic uh, manipulation that I, I, I worry about very much. I mean, the fact that this is sort of sloppy manipulation in the sense that, uh, you know, it's not trying to hard to stay inside friction cones and it's, it's sliding, it's doing all these things. I actually think that's amazing and good. And we should, I, we, I hope we can see that more. Um, I think we're too conservative with our, our, typical control design. So, I mean, the stuff is amazing and I wanna dig in it over the next two lectures about you know, what it can do, um, what, what we can understand about it uh, and you know, how it compares to some of the other approaches we've been talking, to, talking about. Uh, this is just, I guess, to round out a few of the early success stories, this was um, the opening the door at the Google Arm Farm example that was also super cool, uh, where they would have lots of robots pooling their experience, um, training policies to try to open the door, and uh, you know nobody's safe. The robots can open the doors now. So uh, <clears throat> so let's dig in a little bit and, and start to to 
see what I think is uh, good about that, what's bad. I actually, I, um, I'm super curious what people, um, I, I know there's a ton of enthusiasm just from the number of questions and, and, and uh, project proposals and the like. So please like pipe up and ask your questions about, about this stuff as, as it goes to. I think there's one thing that we have to call out immediately, uh, which is that <clears throat> one of the th reasons that those I think look so good and so different is not so much because of the change from some non-learning approach to some learning approach, but from the change from executing plans relatively open loop to executing feedback policies, okay? So that's a big difference um, just to, from, to cast it with some of the examples we've seen before. You know, when we were showing this video before, uh, this is very much a perception system that looked at the mug, decided where it was gonna pick up the mug and then made a plan and basically closed its eyes, went through, picked up the mug, you know, did the task because um, closing the loop on the perceptual feedback from the cameras is actually super hard. Okay, so um, the key point estimation we did there, you could have potentially tried to estimate those key points in real time, but the hand comes in to occlude the sensors, or in that case, it was a wrist mounted camera that got so close to the mugs that it wouldn't have had a good view when it actually had the grasp. Okay, so that was a relatively open loop plan. And, you know, robots for, you know, for a very long time have been more open loop than, I, than we should admit in terms of the their plan about changing the environment, right? And uh, there was there were times when we saw in you know in all these robotics challenges, the Amazon picking challenge, maybe the the MI, certainly the DARPA robotics challenge, where you would you'd see robots just airballing, right, in horrible ways, right? So they there's the, you know maybe the the saddest one is the one where the I could have put the video in, I guess, but the where the humanoid robot goes up and you know the valve is just a little bit over here and it clearly thinks the valve is here and it just kind of goes and falls. <laughs> or sideways as if it had the valve in its hand and it just happens right and that's um it's just obviously wrong that we're not using the sensor feedback while we're executing those more complicated tasks and if our l offers a, a a path to closing those feedback loops then that's amazing right so the, just to contrast this was the videos we showed before of of some of the feedback loop and you could see as pete's moving around you know having the difference of of it tracking at real time, the perception system makes a huge, huge difference in sort of the robustness of the, of the system. This was not trained with RL, this was trained with just um, imitation learning. So it just tried to copy uh, the demonstrations, no reinforcement learning. Okay, so it's, it's important to just first acknowledge that there's a difference between plans and policies. Now the relationship between plans and policies is, is complicated, right? So um, you can take, for instance, uh, a planner and uh, run it a bunch offline and come up with a policy, for instance, right? So this is just my favorite simple example from the RRT star where they just wanted to get from the start region, this pink to the goal, but they kept the, the planner running as it, and it just sort of filled up the space. And where the red line is the plan that it's going to execute right now from that particular initial condition. I guess the it's the other way. Uh, no, it is. It's what I said. Um, <clears throat> they've actually f figured out trajectories from basically all initial conditions, right? By just having that run for longer and having an optimizing based optimization based planner. You know, this in my mind is like we went from a plan to having a policy. Right, the plan is as a, um, a particular trajectory from a particular initial condition and the current configurations of the of the world. Okay, and a policy says I've got uh, I know what I'm going what action I'm going to take from every possible state, every possible initial condition. So, I think there's basically zero debate in the community that we would rather have policies than plans ultimately. Um, but there, you know, it's highly contentious, I guess, which way, you, how do you get those policies? Uh, this is one approach would be to do offline planning and try to pre-compute the, the policies. There's also the idea of model predictive control, which is, um, I'll actually just make sure I write that. So, you know, so also 
model predictive control. which is basically a way to turn a planner into a feedback policy by you, you know, measure current state. Make a plan for the next time steps. So UN, UN plus one, okay. You execute the very first step and then throw away your plan, you know, right? So if you can plan fast enough and reliably enough and consistently enough online, then by just, you know, making a plan from wherever you are right now, taking exactly the first action of that plan and then replanning, that's a perfectly good way to turn a planner into a policy. And it can make a huge difference in this, in the type of robustness. Okay, but um, at the same time, um, at the same time, the results I showed you before would be hard to achieve with model predictive control or with the RRT approach, because there's something else that's happening here, which is that we've gone from full state feedback to output feedback in my mind. Okay, so um, so right now we have a plant, our simulator, right, our MVP, for instance, multi-body plant, and it's outputting some um, sensor measurements. Okay, and it's taking in some commands. In order to use the planner and to get X and to to write a, a controller based on it. We have mostly ignored or we've used cheat ports, but you need some sort of state estimator. You can imagine, I mean, the perception systems we've done on pose estimation and the like are state estimators, but but in order to have a, a feedback loop closed on it, we would need to evaluate our pose estimator on every time step in order to be able to close a real time loop on it. And this gives us some estimate of the, of the state. And then I can run my full state feedback on it. So if I had um, RRT star or MPC or whatever control design in here, that would work. You know, and I can feed that all the way back to my U. Okay. Um, yeah, this is the full state feedback approach. And honestly, it dominates control to a fault, I think. Um, there are cases, you know, the, there are cases where it is the optimal thing to do. Uh, and those cases are so, I think, seductive for, for the mathematics and the rigor of it and stuff like this, that it, uh, we've relatively spent less time understanding optimal control in the output feedback case because it's harder. Okay, so the output feedback would be put my, um, my controller here U, and I'm going to just directly put my control policy here. We'll call it pi or whatever. Um, output feedback, you could call it pixels to torques, if you will. It doesn't have to actually go all the way to torque. You could put a, a differential IK. You could, you know, put this in Q desired, for instance, and have a if I K block here, I would still call that an output feedback controller. Absolutely. You've just done it on a slightly higher level model of your robot where it, which takes position commands. <clears throat> okay. Um, now that's a much, much harder problem because somehow if Y is, um, you know, Y is pixels or, or Y is some complicated partial observations of my full state, then the controller has to, um, you know, has to be designed in some different way. 
it doesn't, it's not obvious that you can use model predictive control uh, uh, to, to solve this problem. Okay. So the, the goal of, of optimal control, you know, stochastic optimal control, which is an old, old discipline, is to sort of find pi, right? Y equals pi of X. And we'll talk about the stochastic version of this, okay? Um, <clears throat> reinforcement learning, in my mind, Uh, the the definition of reinforcement learning has um, sort of evolved over time, or the 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 umbrella of things that you might call a reinforcement learning algorithm or might not might have evolved over time. But the um, the hallmark, I think, of the reinforcement learning algorithms that distinguishes them from the results in control is their particular algorithms for designing the optical feedback controllers. Um, especially in model-free contexts, where I don't have to have a model of my plant. Well, Sebastian said, uh, shouldn't it be u equals pi x? Thank you, yes. Uh, I, I would even say u equals pi y, thank you. Okay, so, um, and, and actually people in control have thought about the model free case too, but somehow I think there are, there are a number of results that really grew up in a, originally in reinforcement learning that are the hallmarks of what we see today. Um, and there are also places where control and reinforcement learning sort of solved um, similar problems. In fact, let me, uh, so I actually, um, we saw a talk not so long ago from Sean Main um, uh, at the RL boot camp at, uh, at the Simons Institute at Berkeley. And I couldn't help but, but grab a couple of his slides and put them up here because it's super interesting actually. So Sean is um, you know, senior to me too. And he was saying, you know, there was already reinforcement learning. There were dreams of model free control you know, well before his grad student days, right? And um, we didn't call it reinforcement learning back then. It was called adaptive control, and it's still there. Is still a, a great, strong branch of adaptive control. Okay, um, and it, it's interesting. You know, conclusions after sixty-five flight. You know, an accurate a priori knowledge of the aerodynamic characteristics is not needed. Roughly model free, right? And um, and that this they were flying these X-15s, and it was incredible and good. And people were doing model free control, like on serious things, right? And um, you know, long story short, there were more and more flight tests. Um, there was some notion that maybe gain changes due to disturbance inputs weren't well characterized, and uh, you know, and then this happened. And uh, in a sort of tragic way, like not, I mean, that flight was tragic, but it set back it it changed the course of control theory. Um, the a lot of the work. Um, fell out of fashion that was on model-free control at the time. Um, and in general, there, uh, you know, I think there was always maybe a conservative tone to, to the, some of the, the control, but it, the focus on certifying robustness, guaranteeing performance, the theoretical guarantees that could go with that, you know, it became, the field became more dominated by um, people proving how hard <laughs> reinforcement learning was and less on the approximate algorithms that would work for um, you know, flipping shoes and, and the like. So it's, it's actually super interesting. And then you know, um, uh, you know, time has gone by and, and uh, I mean, I actually did my thesis with the reinforcement learning in the title in 2005. It was kind of in the, you know, after it was cool and before it was cool again. Um, so that was bad timing on my part, but hey. Um, and, and then you know, machine learning happened and, uh, uh, and now everybody's, excited about RL again. And we're in a different place now. I think a lot of the questions and algorithms are actually not so different than what we did. We're talking about 
you know, uh, many years ago and certainly in the time of my thesis, but the computers are faster, the simulators are better and the approaches are bolder, um, you know, in a really awesome way. Like never would have thought of putting pixels into a policy and asking that to work and, uh, or trying to, you know, solve some of the crazy problems that we're trying to solve with manipulation reinforcement learning now. So it's, it's, it's actually awesome. Um, you know, to see that progression, but but super interesting if you ever look at the, at the history of it. Okay, so um, <clears throat> this idea here is, um, you know, one of the one of the key ideas in reinforcement learning would be to, um, I mean, you can break up reinforcement learning as a as a discipline into men, in many different ways. You can talk about model based versus model free. You can talk about the different approaches. Um, I think one of the key distinctions is whether you search for the policy, the, the controller directly, or whether you try to search for something like the Q function, which some of many of you know, and, and I will describe more in a little bit. Um, but let's start with the, the policy uh, search form of, of reinforcement learning. Okay, so um, I mean, the, the idea is natural, especially when you have function approximators like deep networks, you know, a natural question would be, if I write somehow my controller as a big, um, you know, deep network, for instance, with, with weights, you know, with parameters, theta, then can I design an algorithm that will tune theta with stochastic gradient descent or whatever in order to optimize some long-term objective, okay? And it's really interesting to think about uh, whether that's a good way to go. <laughs> like why, why would you choose to um, search directly in the space of policies versus some of the other representations that we understand? Like, you know, in, in planning, for instance, we worked our way through state space and dynamic programming if you know the algorithm works its way through state space, it doesn't search in the parameters of the policy. Um, so there's a couple of reasons why that can be good. Um, one of them I would say is um, the fact that there's a chance if we parameterize it this way that we can leverage, I mean, I guess leveraging deep nets is maybe the first obvious um, good opportunity. But I think um, searching directly in the parameters is also maybe an opportunity uh, to use our output from perception in a way that need not have like a, a simple instantiation, right? Uh, you could, you could, you can just learn some map from some latent variables that are in coming out of your, you know, the feature layer of your deep network. And uh, that's okay in this approach. You don't have to have some sort of notion that those variables are complete or, or, or they cover the space or anything like this. Right, you, could, you can use some you know, deep network representation. There's another reason why it could be good, which I actually, um, I believe people haven't exploited yet. And that's that I think there are very complicated problems that actually have very simple controllers that, you know, so it can be that the plant is very complicated, you know, that the trajectories that the plant, that the controller should execute are very complicated but actually a pretty simple controller can, can solve the problem. Um, so, so here's my favorite example is, uh, oops, I went the wrong way. My favorite example here is, is actually from hopping. Sorry, that's my first love, okay? But we've always, always argued that, um, you know, Mark Rabert's simple hopping robot, this is the thing that led the way to a lot of the Boston Dynamics robots, um, you know, this is actually a pretty complicated system. In under actually, we talk about how complicated it is. It's got impacts. It's got, you know, all these collisions. It's got um, under actuated dynamics. You know, Mark's controller is described com basically completely. Uh, he's got a nice, be a beautiful book. Uh, you know, hundred 
some pages of a book and the entire control description for this robot, which he then extends to two legs and four legs and with basically no other text, uh, it all fits on a single page, right? And it's super intuitive, super simple. It basically leverages ideas that, you know, when I'm in the air, I roughly can move my leg forward and my body won't move so much. And when I hit the ground, I, I torque my hip and, and now my body moves. And, um, you know, basically if I, if I push a little harder, if I push a little more air into my cylinder, my air cylinder on the leg, then I'll bounce a little higher. Super simple. I mean, that was Mark's, uh, you know, genius. And, and the, the people who were working with Mark at the time in the leg lab, their genius was this very simple controller to solve this very complicated system. But, you know, and, and often these systems are, um, they look like state machines. I mean, that comes up over and over again. You see people that write complicated manipulation controllers, um, and they almost always are of the form, like reach until you touch, do something else until you touch. They're, they're typically guarded on simple sensor observations. Um, another example of that is actually, you know, uh, Boston Dynamics Spot, right? So when Spot was opening the door, you know, this is Andy, who was a student at MIT uh, before this. And, um, you know, Andy writes these controllers that are, uh, you know, they're similarly, I don't know exactly the details of them, but just my, my sense from all the conversations is that, you know, they, these are similarly relatively simple controllers that are, you know, reach until you touch, you know, if, if, uh, if the door is, is, you know, on my arm, then I do one thing. If someone pulls my tailbone, you know, then I do a different thing, but they're super robust, but very simple. There's no deep learning in the first versions of these. I'm sure it's coming, um, you know, now, but super robust controllers, uh, that are relatively very simple despite the complexity of the task and the dynamics. Okay, so for me, that's a major motivation uh, for trying to search directly in the space of, of controllers. Uh, but it's not one that we've totally realized yet because I think um, you know, most people are learning deep policies, not, not these simple con controllers, and we don't actually know which one works better. Um, and this is just making the point that I, I made on the slides a second ago here, but we can really, in the visual motor policies, the fact that we can write a policy that uses these latent representations Z, who knows what Z is and who cares in some sense, as long as I have a, a, a control design that can just reason about this system and design pi directly by, by changing uh, theta, then I can use uh, uninterpretable by human Zs and, and do potentially incredible things in the visual motor policy space. Yeah, let me make sure I pause, take a breath every second. I see chats going now, okay. All right, so good. So um, this, this is a super good question um, wh about whether policies, whether the, the fact that you have a, um, a simulator implies that you have a plant model. So, um, and I thank you for, for, the partial, for the first answers there. So yes, um, highly contentious, I would say, but some people say model-free uh, RL and then they uh, have a simulator. So you've got to, you had to have a model to make that work, you know, what the heck. Uh, I think the, the, the hallmark of model-free RL is that you could run it on the robot without a simulator. And if, you know, if it would work on a robot with no model, then, then you're good, right? There are different levels of models that you can have. You can have just a simulator that you consider to be a black box. You can have a simulator that has gradients available and the like. Um, but, but most people would argue that a model free algorithm is one that doesn't exploit more information from the simulator, that it doesn't exploit any of the cheat ports and doesn't ask for gradients or, or deterministic, you know, I mean, the, the ability to reliably reset to a known initial condition is a big one that a lot of people will say they're doing something that's model free, but actually you could never reset your robot perfectly and do the same experiment twice. So that boundary of whether you've actually done a model free algorithm or not is, is really interesting. Yes, pixels are Y in the diagram I showed earlier. And uh, good, so searching in the space of simple controllers, you know, is that like automated tuning of simple controllers of the PID gains? That's a great example, you know, and there are, um, you know, ways to auto tune PID for, for tasks. Um, yes, so, so if we were to write down, um, you know, the state machine for Mark Rayburn's hopper, 
had a number of parameters. It actually did have PD controllers in each of the inside each of these modes, modes, but it also has guards, which says which say like the conditions that I'm on my sensor values that would cause me to transition to this next. You could write parameters for those two and search over those parameters and see how they affect your total performance. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I think typically, uh, yeah, so there's an open question about whether you also search for the topology of your, of your uh, state machine. Uh, we don't know if that, how well we can do that. Great. Um, feel free to unmic and ask these questions too, that's good. Especially when I missed them, I didn't have my chat open. Okay, um, so let's dig in and start seeing how we would actually um, start writing, the, start doing that optimization. And if there's one thing that I wanna make sure that people understand, it's that um, it's sort of the difference, I think, from going from purely, uh, purely model-based optimization to purely model-free and, and the intermediate steps that you can use. So um, the first thing to, to think about is just, uh, let me get my slides back here. Okay, so um, this is actually a, I would say an unsolved problem. Uh, in general, if I'm watching a robot tie shoelaces or chopping carrots or something like this, uh, even understanding how to score the results if my, out, if my sensors are only images is actually a super hard problem. But there are a number of places where you can imagine writing a scoring function. Maybe you've, um, you've got to drop a ball in a bin and there's a little sensor in the bin and knows when you've su succeeded or, or whatever. There's a, there's a lot of cases where you can actually um, uh, measure the objective. And then you would tend to score your, your cost function based on uh, some, some total function. We'll call it uh, G of X zero and theta. Uh, and this would be somehow the black box view of the world from initial conditions X zero. Policy parameters theta. This is sort of my simulation function, which would tell me the, you know, all everything I need to evaluate the cost G it would, it would ultimately output my cost over some, um, over some trajectory, okay. Yeah, there's this funny thing that, um, all the people who do control first have to apologize because they use cost instead of reward. I, um, you know, reinforcement learning people give reward and control people give cost. And uh, I guess that makes us bad people, but it's habit, I can't break it. So, um, so some simulation function that, uh, you know, that simulates forward and outputs a total cost. You know, um, I give I, I watch the robot, I give it a score of 10 because it, it did a good job that time or a score of 20 if you, on this other one. And its goal in life is to minimize the cost or maximize the reward. But typically we think of this as a simulation that is, um, that is noisy or somehow has, is stochastic. And it's important, a big part of RL is that we tend to optimize the expected value, the average reward. So that expected value can, can be over initial conditions. Simulation parameters, noise, disturbances that you might model. Okay. And we'll call that whole thing um, the expected value over all those, all those things, which would be including over initial conditions, we'll call it our loss L. Okay. Um, Thinking about the right way to write those is, is actually super interesting. And um, the way people do it in, let me just show you this. So the way people do it in, in practice is, uh, you know, really the contract you have between 
you know, your uh, simulator, let's say, and the, um, the optimizer is very simple. Uh, there's a few public uh, benchmarking sort of uh, a APIs that allow this, allow this to happen, right? OpenAI Gym is the one I think that's maybe the most popular these days. Uh, and it's very simple. If you want to make your uh, simulator, basically, a, let's say a, a Drake simulation that wanted to act like uh, something that an RL algorithm could be put against, all you have to do is provide a few different interfaces. You have your basic initial, you know, set up your whole simulator, uh, which would be our diagram builder and the like. Stepping is just equivalent to taking, uh, you know, advancing the simulator by point one by one, whatever, and returning the sensor observations and the reward are all output from the step function. You know, reset is just the idea of resetting your context in our in our language, and you know, rendering would be something that would be like you know, send your output to MeshCat. Okay, and given just that contract, but this is now, you know, because we have, uh, we can have random initial contexts, um, this is actually now uh, uh, something that you could, you could run many times, ask for the expected value of your total reward. That interface is enough to like apply a bunch of the basic, the baseline algorithms, OpenAI provides a bunch. Um, this is the, the blog post where they, they talk about it, but in their current repo, they have A2C, which is an actor critic algorithm, Acer, all these algorithms that you might have heard of, DDPG, DPQ, you know, PPO, TRPO. Uh, this is a, a parallel algorithm version of, of TRPO. Okay, so, but what about the randomness? So, so the other thing that's happened is that, um, you know, people have, have been very aggressive, I would say, in manipulation. In, in making the, the worlds more random. So the expected value of like the initial conditions that I'm talking about is, is uh, sounds benign, but it can be sort of crazy randomness that people add to the environment. So um, domain randomization is the, is the, maybe the popular name for it, but in, in general, people are like turning the lights on and off on the robot. They're adding leopard prints to, to texture maps. They're doing all kinds of crazy stuff and asking the algorithm to try to maximize the average returns over this wide distribution of different simulations and different tasks, okay? And I think that's good. I think that's fundamental. I think the fact that, um, that we're doing that now and we're in a less uh, cautious way than we've done in the past might be one of the reasons why we've seemed to have success on really hard problems that actually if you ask the same controller to work on a variety of tasks, it might actually be much easier to find that controller. Okay, so uh, <clears throat> So that's what I mean by this expected value over um, over simulations. Expected value really could be like, I turned the lights on, uh, I ran the simulation again. There's some probability of the lights being in any different configuration. And, I, and every time I, I run that simulation, I get a reward and I take the average of that to get my cost. Now, how do we optimize um, that objective, right? I would say there's there's um, there's sort of two cases that we understand, and 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 everything else is um, is just hoping for gradient descent to do the right thing. Okay, there, but there's two cases where we, we we really do understand a lot. The first one is the um, discrete state actions, tabular model um, markup decision process. MDP, I'm not gonna write all of the notation of MDP here, but this is, um, if you have relatively small discrete state, discrete actions, and 
discrete time, typically. Then you can actually, um, you know, enumerate your state space. We understand very well how to do a direct search in the uh, representation of policies. So in this case, um, uh, a policy, uh, which would typically, if I, I try to use A when I'm discrete, would be some policy of discrete actions from discrete states. There's sort of the way that we represent this is as a table. And we understand a lot about the algorithms for um, for policy iteration that, and understand when they converge, how to evaluate the total score that uh, the expected returns of a particular policy. If you give me a pie, um, you know, with a particular table, I can, in a, with a, solving a linear set of, a set of linear equations, I can tell you what its score is going to be from through the expected value. I can tell you its average score, and then I can give you a good algorithm for making an incremental update to that policy and tell you even how those algorithms are going, to, how those iterations are going to converge to a policy. Okay. The other case that we understand well is when things are linear and Gaussian. Should be capitalizing the names, but I'm sorry. Um, especially with, let's say, that the, the, the important point is that the dynamics are linear and Gaussian. The example is with quadratic costs. Okay. And um, so if I had a dynamical system, right, at continuous time or discrete time, that's given by this, I can even add noise. And I say that X zero is also drawn from a normal distribution. Okay. Then um, let's say hypothetically that my cost function is my infinite horizon cost. And I want my loss function to be the expected value over that, right? Then <clears throat> this problem, I think people um, probably know that the optimal policy in this particular problem, we know to be a linear policy. So we're gonna, if we wanted to search over K directly, then we could do this. So we, we know optimal policy is linear. The cool thing is that we can actually, um, you know, as soon as you get to continuous actions, continuous policies instead of discrete states, discrete actions, uh, then instead of talking about policy improvement, we talk about policy gradient, okay? So we can ask, what is the gradient with respect to theta of this loss function, okay? And we're gonna see this in a general algorithm. I don't think that the world is particularly linear and Gaussian, and I don't think it's particularly well represented by uh, discrete state, discrete action, MDPs of any reasonable size. Um, but you know, this, because this is sort of the one case where we can really understand things, uh, it's useful to just understand uh, that, you, that you can do this math exactly. And I won't write all of it down for you, um, but, but the key idea here is that I can actually, if you give me a K, right, then I can solve I can solve for x of t, I'm sorry, with my matrix exponential, a minus b k t dt, yeah, uh, x zero dt. And 
And I can even, if I know that the initial conditions are from a Gaussian, then I can even solve for the expected value of this. This is actually something I can compute directly. Okay. The beautiful thing about a Gaussian going through a linear system is that the state distribution stays Gaussian. Okay. With my quadratic cost, I can actually, maybe I'll cartoon just a little of it so you see what it looks like. If I wanted to write, um, so I'm going to write L of K, which is the same thing, right? I can actually rewrite with a little bit of matrix math here that that whole uh, cost function as the trace of um, Q plus K transpose R times the expected value of my total X of T transpose X of T. Okay, and this thing, it turns out I can, if I call that some matrix X, I can actually solve in closed form for X for any, you know, using this observation here, I can solve in closed form for X. It actually, it just has to solve, satisfy some linear matrix equation. And I can explicitly take the gradients. partial K in this case, L of K, okay, through the expected value, all right, and through the plant and through the, through everything. I can actually tell you, if you change a little bit K, I can tell you how the expected cost is going to change. Now, this is what I would call the, you know, this is, uh, you know, this is how you would do gradient descent in the reinforcement and the optimal control problem. And it's actually pretty recent that people have, have, have understood that this, even though that this landscape is actually not convex in K, you can see it, it turns out K enters in a, in a fairly complicated way. They've just recently proved that actually, um, I think some people thought it was, it, was, it was clear, but they've recently shown that uh, doing gradient descent directly in K will actually find the optimal solution. So that was sort of a, a big deal to be able to clarify that and to understand more generally when these kind of approaches work is a, is a hot topic for the theory coming towards our RL. Okay, okay. good. I think I got logged out on that machine. So I have to... can you tell me the question, Terry, while I try to find my- uh, Yeah, so Antonio was just wondering where um... Or the equation for LK came, came from? This is um, a standard. So the these are scalars, OK? U is just, um, we're going to replace it with U equals negative KX. I guess I wrote it as positive KX in this case. OK, with a scalar, you can take the trace and move the Xs to the other side. So if I take the trace of X transpose QX, for instance, I can write this, that's the same as writing uh, the trace, the trace is um, cyclic, right? And so you can write X, X transpose like this. Um, so I got my transpose in the wrong place down there, but, um, and similarly with the U terms. So that's what separates out this, this uh, Q's K are, uh, K out in front and all of the X terms group. The only term that is stochastic are the X terms. Those are just fixed. So the expected value can slip down into here. And then the, I think the impressive thing is that, um, that when you, in order to solve for that, this is like a covariate state covariance matrix. Okay. Uh, the fact that you can solve for that in a nice way is, is the magic of linear Gaussian systems. So you can solve for X by solving some linear equations. But this is just a rewrite using the trace of that original cost function. Uh, 
in, in fact, the um, the results about the convergence of uh, okay, sorry, policy for linear Gaussian. Oh, so you're answering. Thank you. Good. The um, <clears throat> Right. This this idea that you can actually take the gradient through the expected value is it's really I think pretty narrow for um, for linear systems because typically you don't know if you change the policy parameters if you have a nonlinear system um, even if you started with a, a Gaussian uh, initial set of initial conditions if you move those through a nonlinear system then that that um, Distribution can be very complicated, arbitrarily complicated for, for nonlinear systems, but even mild nonlinearities can make that very complicated. So um, simulating any one path, that's something we do with simulators all the time, but simulating the distribution is not something we do with simulators all the time. So in practice, for the more general case, So we approximate it with a Monte Carlo, for instance. Just to say, we're gonna run the simulator n times, and we'll say that the expected value of running with that policy is approximately equal to the average that I get from running the simulator n times. With some where each each time I run the simulator, I get a slightly different uh, you know noise, a slightly different initial condition, and I'll just take the average. Okay. So that's the first thing we give up as we go um, as we go farther on. But um, if you can take a, a gradient through your entire simulator, which um, isn't crazy, right? So. Um, you could potentially still write the policy gradient the, the gradient of this thing is a, you can take the gradient on the inside right So if you're willing to sample to, to compute the average, then you can um, you know, just try to take the gradients along particular rollouts of your simulator. And actually the gradients that we take here are not so different than the gradients that we do in trajectory optimization. So um, there was a time where people would have maybe thought that was very hard, uh, but I think we have, you know, if you have, let's say a differentiable simulator, then you can take that gradient directly, okay? So who has a differentiable simulator, right? So um, this is <laughs> one of my uh, pet peeves is when people say, oh, I've made a differentiable physics engine. Cause I think basically all physics engines are differentiable. If you, um, there's nothing about a physics. I mean, it could be that your, your simulator doesn't uh, output the gradients. It doesn't give you a, an API access to the, to the um, to the gradients, and it could be that the gradients are discontinuous. Uh, they almost certainly are for any um, hard contact model, but um, but we can give gradients through simulation. We've always been able to do that. Um, you know, Drake uh, does it explicitly with an auto diff functionality. We can we can give gradients back through that. Um, Ujoko does it explicitly. Other simulators do that explicitly for the physics engine. The um, so differentiable physics is, I think fine, should be expected, I guess. Differentiable rendering, if your, out, if your Y observations, if your, if your simulation loop requires going through uh, a camera model in order to do image-based feedback, um, differentiable rendering is hard. So, uh, so
people are working on it and there are examples where people do it. We've played with it a bit um, too, but um, certainly for high-end rendering uh, engines like you would get from, um, from Blender or something like this, these things are not just um, discontinuous and hard to take gradients through whatever, but they're, they actually tend to not be deterministic, right? The people, you know, the ray tracing algorithms actually are um, intentionally random because it makes things look more natural, right? So, so you have to sort of, it's an exercise to actually provide um, a, a renderer that it, you could take explicit gradients through. Okay, but for tasks where you don't need a renderer, um, you don't need a, a camera model um, or, a or a perception system, I think, uh, you know, we can take gradients through the simulator and I, it's kind of crazy not to, I think. So, um, you know, there could be some very subtle reason that nobody has carefully articulated yet about the way we're doing numerical approximations of those gradients that somehow makes the gradient descent optimization better or something like that. But, um, but I think most of the work in RL that does have a simulator that doesn't take gradients is um, solving a harder problem than they need to. I think they should be taking gradients. So, um, but having said that, we can, we can look at somehow, you know, how people, how you would write that down, okay? So <clears throat> this is sort of one extreme is uh, true gradients and close to it is uh, Monte Carlo for the expected value plus true uh, sim gradients. That would be one way to start trying to do a gradient based optimization. Okay, the other extreme, which I'll write down here, is pure black box optimization, which I'll talk about next. And RL, most of policy gradient RL actually sits in the middle here. Um, so the black box optimization will assume I have no gradients whatsoever. The policy gradient RL will assume I don't have a, um, of a model of the plant, but will take gradients of the policy. So if you have a deep network in your policy, for instance, you'll, you'll use gradients of policy, but assume no plant. Okay, and if you know the algorithms, the PPO, TRPO, A2C, right, they're all fighting down, they're all different versions of policy gradient, which are, um, you know, trying to make efficient estimates of the true gradient by exploiting as much as they can of the gradient of the policy and not knowing the gradient of the plant. So, um, yeah, in many cases, I think we should just use gradients of the plant directly um, unless there's some deeper reason. Uh, but the, uh, there's also this approach of using black box optimization completely. And that's, that's interesting to think about. So um, so one of the ways to do black box optimization completely is our algorithms like CMAES. And let me actually um, write down. So there's a bunch of, um, there's a bunch of toolboxes for this. Nevergrad is a really good one. OpenAI Gym has a few. This is by FAIR, by Facebook research, Facebook AI research. Um, the, you know, these algorithms, basically they're trying to minimize over X or call it theta, L of theta, by just taking, they only allow to, you know, you give me a theta, return an L, uh, and I will try to optimize based on only that. They're called black box optimization. They're sometimes called zero order optimization. If a gradient based method is a first order method, if a, if a quadratic programming based method is a second order method, um, you know, these black box are zero order methods.
And CMAES, ES actually stands for evolutionary strategy. Um, these are genetic algorithms, which were popular way back in, in the day. Uh, and they've come back in, in force and they are state of the art for many of these optimizations. So even if my parameters are, um, are you know, if I have many, many parameters in my controller, potentially a relative, somewhat deep network, I, we've talked about how the policy networks tend to be not as deep as the perception networks. Um, but people sometimes advocate for searching directly in those um, parameterizations by just using trial and error, you know, black box tools like, like CMAES. So the picture you should have in your head here is you've got some landscape. This is what I'm um, showing on the slides now is I've got some optimization landscape. I'm trying to drive towards the minimum instead of taking a particular sample and, and evaluating its gradient and moving towards the, um, the minimum. I'm only allowed to take, you know, many samples, but I'm going to uh, evaluate those samples, evaluate the cost of each of those samples, decide a new generation of, of samples that I'm going to pick on the next time step. Uh, the, the CMA is covariant matrix a, a adaptation. So uh, it's based on estimating some covariance matrix here, which is it, it represents the samples with some um, Gaussian distribution, basically. And will draw samples in order to climb down this noisy landscape. And it has you know, convergence in the simple cases, but tends to work well as a more global optimization in surprisingly high dimensional cases too. So as opposed to gradient descent, which would pick a point and immediately go to a local minima, this one, since it has many samples going out, has a chance of going down, a, you know, multiple, exploring multiple local minima and eventually converging to a more global optima. And um, honestly, I think I got negatively biased against uh, genetic algorithms when I was when I was younger or whatever. But when I started hearing that people were using this for serious optimization, I thought it was crazy. Um, but I I take it back. So I, I feel I think people have understood now that these are these are pretty sufficiently good algorithms. Um, we have been using them recently. Uh, this is the plate pickup example from from. TRI, uh, we've been putting them to use. Uh, Andres has been optimizing with CMAES um, policies, feedback policies to pick up plates and random over a, you know, a diversity of initial simulations, right? And trying to find a feedback controller now to, to reliably pick up these plates. The first controller that we wrote for this task that we've used for a long time is looks a lot more like Raybert's controller. It's a hand-designed uh, feedback machine that it's, it reaches until it touches, slides its fingers under until it touches. It works incredibly well. Um, but uh, when it doesn't work, a human has to go back and fix it. And the appeal of, of solving this directly from simulation is that we can design new skills more quickly and, and fix skills whenever we find counterexamples. So, you know, this is now working directly from, with a more output feedback of, of using uh, not the renderer, Directly, but using key points and uh, and sending that into a, an optimal feedback or a, a parameterized policy, and using basically genetic algorithms through Nevergrad to to optimize the policy, and you know, running many many simulations many times, but um, you know it works, it works, and it works. It now recently started working on the three D version too. Yes. Uh, over a very, biology operates entirely on genetic algorithms, but maybe it takes longer than I wanna wait for, uh, for my robots. And actually the CMAES, they, they, they point out even in their paper that, that uh, uh, you know, the, the algorithms are, are fairly divorced from the genetic algorithms that they originally were inspired directly by biology. Now they're, you know, they're numerical recipes that, that work well. Uh, but this is this is working pretty well, and you know it's become a real technology to just directly do black box optimization and ask. I've got some complicated uh, landscape. Can I just search directly in it? Right. So when these kind of papers came out, it, I, I found it very surprising that people would argue that um, that you don't actually have to take even the gradient of your policy, even when you're uh, when you're optimizing through a deep network, relatively deep network. That, um, that actually just black box optimization can be as performant. And I think one of the big reasons for that is that um, these things, it says right there is a scale, these things scale 
trivially to many, many processors. So for the, um, in particular in the regime where you have like ridiculous numbers of CPUs, you can, you can run all of these in parallel and, um, and it's hard for the, poly, the more gradient based optimizations to compete. Okay, so um, <clears throat> the other, I've lost my, my visual on that machine, but all the extra work, like I said, is in the middle here. So um, go back to my slides. all the extra, all the remaining work here is about policy gradient. And uh, it's really about, uh, I think not everybody thinks clearly about this. It's really, the idea is, can you use the gradients of your policy, uh, but not the gradients of your plant? And the simplest realization of this is, um, I think, if you wanted to just say, I want to minimize over theta, for instance, um, my expected value of my loss function, uh, g of theta. Okay, but let's say, or let me write it a slightly different way. Let's say this is my, um, the output of my policy here, but I want you to be some, um, the output of my neural network in a uh, way that confuses a lot of people. Oftentimes we think about the policy being stochastic so that we can write these algorithms efficiently. And we say that the distribution of the um, of actions that this thing's taking is dependent on theta. So there's some some distribution uh, over the theta parameterized distribution. Okay. So what happens if you know this? This is like the neural network plus a Gaussian. Let's let's say for instance. And this is, let's say, the simulation function or something, or the, the other parts that I don't know. I've taken the integral away just to keep it simple to begin with. Okay. But how would you do an optimization where you know something about the, um, you know, part of the, part of the terms, but you don't know the gradient of G, right? Typically, if I had, um, if I had something like this, I would do, if I knew um, the gradients, I could just take partial, partial, um, partial G, partial U, partial U, partial theta, right? Would be a, a chain rule sort of to, to take the gradient on the inside and then I would take the expected value of that. Okay, but I'm saying I don't have this. I, I only have this. How can I do um, some better optimization? Okay. <clears throat> um, this is, the, this is the class of, of policy gradient algorithms. And here's what people often say, right? There's a policy gradient trick you see. You'll see people write the expected value with respect to theta of E of G theta. Let me try to write a little slower, a little more carefully. is the expected value of G of um, U uh, partial partial theta log of P of theta. I'm changing my symbols on my, between my notes in here, it screwed me up. Um, you see this, this gradient of the log probability that shows up all the time, okay? And the derivation is only a few lines and it's true and it's good, um, but it's totally misleading. So what you, what you see uh, when people say this, um, th this equality absolutely holds, okay? But you'll see people say, it's really surprising that the gradient of the policy performance 
only depends on the parameters of the plant and doesn't re require the gradients of the, of the sorry, uh, only requires the gradients of the controller and not the gradients of the plant. And that is uh, not true. What is true is that you can write an update that of this form, which in expected value um, has the same gradient as this, but that is very different than saying the true gradient of this is, um, you know, is given by this. Ask questions, make sure I land that point because I, I said that badly, okay? Um, it's actually very easy to write an algorithm that goes downhill on average, okay? I can actually pick a point at random. I can just sort of do um, random search. Okay, CMAES is doing something so fairly similar. I can accumulate that knowledge and I can make an algorithm that moves downhill on average, okay? Um, but if the, the problem with this is that it can take many samples, or in this case, the, um, if I write this as a single sample, then it has high variance, okay? So if I were just to just make any one um, change, make an update, do a random change, make an update, take a random change, make an update. It is true that with, a, with this simple update, it will on average go downhill, okay? But the variance of that update in this direction can be extremely large. And all of the, um, a lot of the talk about reinforcement learning and policy gradient optimization is about um, reducing the variance of that, of that stochastic policy search, okay? Okay, so if you look at PPO or, so there's a bunch of algorithms out there, like I showed you on the OpenAI baseline, um, all of these are, are attempts to try to write an algorithm that, um, that reduces the variance effectively of the policy gradient. They do it by different means. Um, one of them is by using a critic, which is by having an estimate of what the expected cost. There's, Is an estimate of the expected cost. Okay, um, some of them use replay. This is, I mean, uh, yeah. This you could also think of as your value function or, uh, or your Q function. Some of them will try to use many samples in order to, to um, you know, accumulate expert uh, knowledge and make a, a, a lower variance update, okay? Um, you know, PPO in particular, it does, um, it, it, which is one of the, the, the popular ones these days, right? It basically um, tries to use uh, a recent history of samples in, in, in order to make a surrogate loss function, which then, you know, is all about reducing the variance of this update. People have used these. I know. I know many of you have used these. Um, does this? Do you do you appreciate the difference that, um, in some sense, all of the work in in the actor critic algorithms and all the policy gradient algorithms are about solving sort of a weird problem. It's this in, intermediate problem of saying I'm allowed to have gradients of my policy, but I'm not allowed to have gradients of my plant. Does that idea make sense? Right, it's super powerful in the um, in the real world where you where you actually don't know the model the dynamics model of my robot, okay. But it's I think it's questionable in the in simulation. I don't know why you would fight so hard to try to reduce the variance of uh, of your policy gradient when you could just take a gradient, um, right? So I think this actually. Um, 
it's it's very interesting to think about when RL actually makes sense um, in in my mind, right? So in a lot of the initial um, work on this, people would argue, for instance, like a dexterous hand has friction in the joints that are, are very hard to model in a simulator. Since I can't trust my simulator, I'm ultimately going to have to uh, run on the real robot. And uh, running on the real robot you know, it needs to be model free. Right? But I don't buy that at all. I think that uh, um, our simulation capabilities of even a dexterous hand are, are super good. Okay. Um, I think the people will also argue that our contact mechanics models are, are actually uh, are not good enough. So if you see the examples of the valve turning or opening the door or, um, or, or whatever, uh, even the open AI cube, right? They're arguing that the contact mechanics in, in simulation is, is often not good enough. But then again, like uh, someone asked, right? Anubhav asked, is if they have a simulation and they did all their training in simulation, then you know, we could kind of end, end that this and the work, the training and simulation worked in the real world, then that argues pretty favorably for the, the capability of the simulator. So um, I think the, the, the really interesting thing that I think put that you can do in the real world that you should, maybe can't do with a simulator is um, get the variability over simulations, right? So uh, a lot of the a lot of the work in the open AI, for instance, is about trying to de design a curriculum of different distributions to try to to try to um, you know add noise in different ways to the robot as it's learning. And I think the real world has particular variability that you don't get in simulation. Um, so that's a big reason to do it. Um, I think the connections to perception are a big reason to do it. And I think honestly that you know me and, and the people in my field have sort of failed to give a better model-based control design through contact. Uh, but it's not because you, it doesn't exist. It's that um, you know, somehow uh, RL is, is often solving problems that, that we haven't been able to solve with the model-based in a better way. So I think one of the biggest questions these days is, um, I'm sorry, I was sloppy at the end there, but I will, I'll write that carefully because I have, I have notes on that. Um, uh, I think one of the biggest questions these days is when do these algorithms actually work and uh, can we trust them to work? Will we ever understand when to expect them to work or when not? Um, I have talked to people who I very much respect who just believe that this, these, these algorithms can solve anything, right? They saw it solve Dota, they saw it solve, solve incredibly hard problems, and now they they um, they are convinced that these algorithms can solve uh, anything. But if they're based on gradients, and we know that the landscapes are very non-convex, then I think there's serious reason to question why that they why they actually work. Um, you know, in deep perception, we have a better understanding now that overparameterization is somehow um, getting around the local minima problem. Uh, I don't have that same understanding for RL yet. I think it's coming in the next few years, but we don't have it yet. I don't know if deep parameterizations are, the, are needed. I think some of the simple parameterizations are working fairly well too. I think the expected value and the domain randomization is a big deal. I think that makes the cost landscapes much better, but I can't quantify that in a rigorous way yet. We're trying. Um, yeah, so, so I'm, I'm glad everybody's optimistic about it. I, I can see the energy in, uh, in the field and in you guys. Um, I really want to understand it better. I think it's, it's definitely powerful. You should please ask questions, yeah? What do you guys think about it? Um, you briefly mentioned like in uh, perception that over parameterization helps avoid Local minimum. How do, I mean, this is kind of a bit distinct from the RL stuff we've been talking about. But how does that work? Yeah, this, I mean, it's been interesting to watch, right? So, so um, I think the results from perception were sort of undeniably strong, and the theorists um, started coming in and trying to to understand, you know. How can we solve these problems? Well, how are we solving these problems that are arbitrarily non-convex? 
and that the um, the rough story is over parameterization, which is um, if I draw it here, this is this is maybe the the high level picture that people say is, is like the number of parameters. Okay, and we the traditional picture was like this is our our performance on the our test error, let's say. Um, the classical view was that you um, you go down in with if you have more parameters until some critical point where you go up again because you start overfitting your data. Okay. Now some people are going to hate these that I'm drawing this curve, but this is the famous, the now famous, infamous double descent curve. Not everybody believes it, but it captures the the spirit of what I'm trying to say. And roughly, the overparameterization story is that, you know, we spent all our time talking about overfitting, trying to find these the sweet spot here, and trying to find the number of parameters so that you get good generalization, but you you know you don't overfit your data, and um, and then you know, Jeff Hinton and others came along and and basically found out that that if you add just ridiculously more parameters, then um, then actually the curve goes back down and it goes way lower and sort of keeps going this way forever, it seems. So um, there are many ways to appreciate why that might happen. But the, um, you know, the, the one liner might be that it seems that if you have if you're in a regime where you have so many parameters compared to your data, then you can basically memorize your data and have interpolating solutions, which um, it, it's not hard to find. Uh, if there are many, many weights of your neural network that can describe the data, then finding any one of them becomes easy again. And actually all it has to do is drive the, the, the error to zero and then basically interpolate between your data points. And that seems to be what deep learning um, you know, that's kind of our understanding of what deep learning is doing right now. I would love to think that that sort of idea could also empower non-convex optimization for control, but I don't know that answer yet. I, I, we haven't seen that connection be made in any, in any clear way. And I, it's not obvious to me that it works the same way. Right. There, you could probably you can you can find ways to take control and put it into a supervised learning context where this might be true again. That's what the imitation learning does, for instance. But in the RL case, it's not clear. Long answer to a short question. No, thanks. That's that's almost like counterintuitive, I guess. Just like I, I have that mental model of the first half of the graph that you showed. Everybody did. It's it's you know um, sort of embarrassing, I guess, that we just but but this is you know ridiculous numbers of parameters, right? This is why neural networks have, uh, you know, millions of parameters and your data set might only be, you know, of similar similar magnitude, right? They are even even these like GPT-3 that's, that is, uh, if you haven't seen GPT-3, you should Google it after this. Um, you know, it's it's absolutely remarkable and it seems to be basically memorizing the, the, all the knowledge on the web with just ridiculous numbers of parameters but you get to interpret, you get incredible results out of it. I have a, I have a question on, uh, um, it's kind of related, but you know, um, I feel like the performance of modern RL algorithms also have to do a lot with the like huge sort of parameterization of the controller, which is, you know, you know, the neural network. So whether it's doing sort of like these, you know, different regions and linear controllers or whatever, um, my question would be, I mean, if we want to optimize, if we want to do a uh, derivative gradient free optimization on those huge size networks or something, um, how's that even possible? I'm not like, you know, for something like ResNet3, some million parameters you're trying to do searching over um, like yeah, yeah. Spaces and... So that's one of the things that I think, um, you know, this, this picture really is important. I think that, that it tends to be, we're not seeing, we're not in the over parameterization regime for the policy itself for the, you know, but only for the perception system, typically, 
So, um, so I think when people are talking about CMA ES for this, they're talking about optimizing just data here, um, right? The relatively smaller network with the perception system frozen. I don't know if anybody's gone so far as to say you can use CMES for for perception. I don't. I haven't heard that. Um, I think we're and we're not. And this is the same reason why we're sort of not in the overparameterization regime yet uh, for control. So those networks tend to be that that pie of theta tends to be you know hundreds of parameters, not uh, millions. It's they tend to be like you know three layer, multi layer perceptrons and stuff like this. Uh, much, much smaller. Yes, Sebastian pointed out the GPT-3. It's, it is crazy how many parameters they're, they're tuning. OK, awesome. Well, we'll um, I'll try to make that um, point a little better on, on Thursday. and. Uh, we will see you then. Actually, there's a great talk. I, I, it should be a, a great talk. I think there's a talk um, from Asu. Uh, I, get, I, I guess I don't know the link. I don't know how public the link is, but there's there's a talk that some of you will have seen from the LIDS mailing lists that um, is happening right now, hopefully on a related topic of, of uh, decentralized learning for reinforcement learning. So I'm going to run to that, but um, see you Thursday. Mm -hmm.